Welcome, everyone. I'd like to take to take the opportunity to say good morning, good afternoon, good afternoon, or good evening. And we are now hosting the third Collingwood World Summit, Habitat in Towns 2022. My name is Ilda Cordero, and I am the Senior Program Manager at the Urban Economy Forum. UEF, in collaboration with the Town of Collingwood and UN Habitat, we are proud to be here today to host this annual Town Summit. The theme this year is to gain a better understanding on how sustainable housing and finance can be a catalyst to achieving the UN Sustainable Development Goals at the scale of towns and small cities. First, we want to acknowledge the traditional territory of the Anishinaabek Nation, the people of the three fires known as Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi Nations. We further give thanks to the Chippewas of Saguin and the Chippewas of Nawash, now known as the Saguin Ojibwe Nation, as the traditional keepers of this land. I would like to introduce the moderator for our opening session, my colleague Anantha Krishnan. Anantha is the Secretary General of the Urban Economy Forum. He has over 36 years of experience in international development work, including over 15 years with the United Nations Environment Program and UN Habitat. Anatha is engaged in youth empowerment initiatives, policy and research, advocacy, and program management, including the development and implementation of sustainable urban projects. Anantha, the floor is yours. Can you unmute yourself? Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Ilda, for a very, very nice presentation. Thank you. Good morning. Good afternoon, everybody. And good evening, too. And I join you in uh, welcoming a very warm welcome to all of you. Mayor Keith Hall, Honorable Brian Saunderson, a member of the Provincial Parliament, Julie Ward, Co-Chair Steering Committee of World Urban Pavilion, and former MEP, Reza Purwaziri, Chair of Urban Economy Forum, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. We are actually proud to have you here virtually at this important annual meet. We are honored to have uh, and delighted to co-host this third edition of Collingwood Summit with what some level 458 registered participants with approximately 90 speakers. Impressive indeed. The summit has also the unique distinction of bringing together such a number of participants when we are living in turbulent and uncertain times. The COVID-19 pandemic, the geopolitical crisis, climate change, ecological disasters, they all threaten the world today. Where do we go for a more hopeful future? How do we find a new path? And what is standing in the way of moving us there? Of course, times of uncertainty also bring opportunities for new thinking and transformation by focusing on the role of towns and small cities and indigenous communities by focusing on the demand the, and, the, and the managed strength and the important role they play in achieving sustainable future. Against the backdrop of rapid urbanization and putting pressure on housing delivery systems, the um, uh, Collingwood Summit also will be focusing on housing financing as a main theme, as was mentioned. The particip participants expected to engage in the conversation of not only housing and also the concept of sustainable building techniques and housing as well. And um, the summit will provide opportunity to examine regional and global connectivity relating to IT and the new information technology. The aim of this summit, in short, will be to continue the conversation on the criteria of sustainability, urban resources, and architectural spatial values that relate to the quality of space with the economic dimensions of towns and small cities also relating to climate change as well as presents the single biggest threat to sustainable human development. But the problem is housing industry, while contributing to climate impacts, very often cities and towns are unable to meet the financial demands that sustainable development requires. We hope that um, the provincial and national governments will indeed be able to participate in financing the needs of small towns, towns and small cities, yeah, jointly with the financial institutions globally. So the, today is also the, the World Cities Day. Um, and uh, may I then request uh, the presentation by Gillian Morris, 
who is a poet laureate of Toronto Collingwood, uh, you know, in um, in Ontario province. Gillian Morris is a Kenyan Kehaka and band member of Six Nations of the Grand River Territory, currently residing in Collingwood. She has a degree in public administration and indigenous governance. She has spent 13 years as a federal public servant before moving into freelance and volunteer work that focuses on redressing history, reclaiming culture, and making space to share stories. We would like to hear Gillian Morris, Poet Laureate. Oh, thank you very much for that introduction. And uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting me here today. I feel very honored um, to be able to be part of opening this space, this virtual space. Um, a very, very important topic. And I just feel that um, that I, I think I have something to offer in in opening this. Um, as part of my culture, I am, as was said, I'm Gani Gahaga, also known as Mohawk. We're part of the Haudenosaunee Confederacy. And um, the Haudenosaunee have a practice um, when they gather at all times. Um, coming into a space, we call it uh, the Owenta Galiwadegwa, but it actually um, loosely translates to the words before all else. And what it does is it thanks um, all the life around us, all the entities, all the species in turn, um, offering greetings and thanks for for the for the fact that they continue to carry out their duties that they were meant to carry out um, their natural duties their, throughout our natural laws. And so um, it's also a reminder for us to honor that as human beings, we are sent here and meant to be here um, for a purpose and for meaning we're not here by accident we are all a part of this life and we are all connected to this natural world and so it really does place us in um in gratitude and in humility when we begin our our gathering together and so i just wanted to mention that and um and then i am going to I, I won't recite um, that address because it is a bit long, but I think that my poem actually um, will give us a bit of of um, grounding us in that gratitude anyway. So, um, so I've shared this actually recently in the town of Collingwood. I just wrote it a couple of weeks ago, but it just felt like a really good fit for this space. And so I'm going to recite a poem that I recently wrote called As She Loves. So humble yourself, let ego fall away, lay upon the earth, close your eyes, feel the rhythm of the land, listen to your mother's heartbeat, greeting you with knowing, re-enter the womb in your mind, comforted as if your years are few, giver of teachings of unconditional love, she offers grace despite our misgivings. The trees begin their dance, filling our vision with color, only to sacrifice that beauty for new life. The winds, the waters, carrying the seeds of tomorrow, all following their natural instructions, honoring an inherent role. All our relations, our kin, our teachers, do you hear them? Do you see them? They love without discrimination. They love as she loves. Awaken her teachings, your sacred duty, and love as she loves. That's it. Okay, so thank you so much for having me here. And I do hope and pray that this has a good outcome and that you are all feeling feeling like this was a productive day. Thank you very much. Uh, what an inspiring me to start this meeting, Julian Morris. Indeed, we have to follow uh, just like the winds and waters follow the seeds of tomorrow. Thanks again, indeed. Wonderful, wonderful. So it sets the whole scene for the meeting today and tomorrow. Thanks again. Now then we have, as I mentioned earlier, today's World Cities Day as well. Uh, so the whole idea of um, let us act local to globe, go global. Let us act local to go global. That is a message from the World Cities Day. And it will be, there'll be a video from 
the executive director of UN Habitat, who also happens to be, he was, before she became the um, executive director of UN Habitat, she was a mayor of not a big city, but of Penang Island, Malaysia. So her words indeed resonates well for the meeting today. Maybe then have the opportunity to listen to the message from uh, the executive director of UN Habitat, Maimuna Mohammed Sharif. We have only about 87 months, 380 weeks, or 2,600 days left to implement the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. The best way to do so is by ensuring our cities and communities are sustainable. These are big words. What I mean to say is that sometimes the solution to the challenges we are facing, such as the COVID-19 pandemic, ongoing conflicts and climate disasters is staring us in the face. At UN Habitat, we work with communities and city managers every day. Cities and communities have the power to help governments translate policy into practice. With the right tools, local leaders can take action on critical needs such as housing, climate adaptation, and safety. City managers very often engage the right partners and find solutions by working together with their communities. But going from local to global is a two-way street. We need all levels of government and all stakeholders to become partners. We need to work alongside each other to rescue the Sustainable Development Goals. This is the key to an inclusive, sustainable and resilient global habitat, one where we live in harmony with nature. The theme of this year's World Cities Day 2022 is Act Local to go global. More than ever, we need to work towards achieving transformative change in our cities to build the future we want. UN Habitat has been at the forefront of localizing the Sustainable Development Goals. We help by continuing to advocate for practical ways to incorporate the SDGs in local plans, creative ways to collect and use data to inform decision making, and most importantly, provide guidelines to ensure wider opportunities for women, youth, and the disabled to participate in the making and implementation of action plans. Participatory budgeting being one such example. We also offer technical expertise to cities, train urban planners, and advocate for strengthening the voice of local and regional governments in the global arena. On World Cities Day, let us confront urban challenges and forge lasting transformative solutions by finding those solutions together. Let's act local to go global. Thank you very much. That was indeed a very apt and timely message from the executive director of UN Habitat, Maimuna Mohammed Sharif. As I mentioned, we are also very thankful to UN Habitat, which has been at the forefront of localizing sustainable development goals. And we hope that the continuing partnership will carry us further in our aspiration to achieve sustainable development goals. Um, next on our um, opening session um, agenda is um, Honorable Elizabeth Doudsville, who is the Lieutenant Governor General of Ontario. Honorable Elizabeth Doudsville is the 29th Lieutenant Governor of Ontario. She has served in the public interest at all orders of government and in the private sector. Um, she contributed globally as the Under Secretary General, then the head of UN Environment Program in Nairobi, 
in Canada, her diverse portfolios range from education, culture to environment, and the management of complex public inquiries. May we have the message now from Honorable Elizabeth Doutsko. Hello, everyone. Bonjour, bonjour. Although we gather from afar, we come together on lands stewarded and shaped by Indigenous people, and to them I offer my gratitude and respect. Well, I'm just delighted to be with you again, albeit virtually. This gathering is a sign of your persistence and dedication to a global vision of resilient and sustainable cities and towns and I very much admire your ambition. You've been engaging in a global dialogue, exchanging ideas and best practices, and doing so during a most turbulent time. We're facing at least three crises, and simultaneously. A pandemic that's not yet over, the existential threat of climate change that's already evident, and an unthinkable war a dramatic turn in geopolitics. It would be very easy to be distracted from our attention to the Sustainable Development Goals. Yet, as we long to return to some form of normalcy, I know that for most it's not a return to the old normal they're seeking. It's a search for a better normal. You know, we've witnessed some very important lessons during the past several years. The impact, the positive impact of collaboration among all orders of government. The growing confidence in science and technology as evidence to guide our policy making. The abilities of industries and institutions to innovate and be creative when human needs become so evident. And the inherent wisdom of building community. But at the same time, we've become ever more aware of our interconnectedness, whether it be supply chains or the fact that until the world is vaccinated, we will still be under threat domestically. As never before, we're coming to understand that the silos of economic and social endeavors are somewhat artificial. Economic prosperity will simply not be assured until we can make progress on social issues, such as childcare and education, allowing women to take their rightful place, should they choose, in the workforce. And perhaps the most significant observation is that the inequities in our societies have been laid bare. We have not all suffered or survived this pandemic equally, and we simply must do better for the vulnerable, and the marginalized in our communities. Well, it seems to me that that sounds very much like a sustainability agenda, approaches that are systemic and holistic. So congratulations to all of you for being ahead of the game. You've been working on designing such solutions for the last three years. While wishing you much continued success in the days to come, I would like to underscore just one last thing. All too often, with the very best of intentions, our numerous Zoom calls and meetings bring together only the like-minded. Perhaps we should be asking ourselves, who's not at this table? The twin challenges of interdependence and inequity point to the need to find spaces for respectful and genuine dialogue with all who are affected. Seeking common cause requires that we really listen to different perspectives. I've often referred to local governments as laboratories for democracy. We need to be ever vigilant if we're going to safeguard something that is so precious to us. For democracy is about so much more than simply a vote. It's really about how we make the decisions that allow us to live together in solidarity. So I hope you'll leave this meeting empowered to be bold and ambitious, to be a leading force for good in an uncertain world. Your voices and visions are needed. My thanks to you all and my very best wishes.
Thank you. Another important, inspiring and forward-looking message that old normal is no more possible and we need a better normal to build back better and forward. And we need to respect diversity and in good people that are not just like-minded to have a genuine dialogue. That's what the Collingwood Summit um, you know, aspires to be and has been in the past three years. Thank you very much again, Honorable Elizabeth Dowdswell. May I now request um, His Worship Keith Hull, Mayor of Collingwood, Canada. Uh, in the Toronto Collingwood's Mayor Keith Hull is the final year of the second term on Collingwood's Council. Mayor Hull has had the pressure of pleasure of serving the residents of Collingwood area and the area council from 2010 to 2014 and the current term from 2018 to 22. Um, as deputy mayor, country, county councillor, acting mayor, and now mayor as well, balance of the current term. Uh, I've had the uh, opportunity of uh, participating with him in organizing this um, summit. May I now request uh, Mayor Keith Hull to uh, say his opening words for this uh, summit. Mayor Hull. Thank you. And uh, hello, everyone. It's my pleasure to uh, welcome you here although virtually, to the beautiful town of Collingwood, uh, located on the southern shores of Georgian Bay in Ontario, Canada. In partnership with the Urban Economy Forum and UN Habitat, uh, the town of Collingwood is proud to host the third annual World Summit with a focus on sustainable housing and finance. On behalf of the town of Collingwood, I'm excited to welcome all of you as world leaders public and private sector partners, and urban activists to share ideas and be inspired for the next two days of the summit. We are grateful for the many leaders, both in the public and private sector, that share our concern and are taking action now. I want to personally recognize the members of the Collingwood Affordable Housing Task Force for their tireless efforts to advance the housing issue over the last two years. You have my gratitude and admiration. I'm optimistic that we can continue to rely on your expertise and passion to help guide us through the action items coming out of the discussions today and tomorrow. Additionally, I wanna personally thank the members of the Collingwood STD, STG Task Force and International Steering Committee for their tireless efforts as we seek to achieve the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. To our colleagues at the Urban Economy Forum and UN Habitat, thank you for your planning and support in making this third annual World Summit a success. Lastly, to my council colleagues here today, thank you for your continued courage and willingness to listen to new ideas and innovations as we prepare for our next actions to address sustainable housing and finance. While the road ahead won't be easy, our ability to navigate it swiftly, efficiently, and collaboratively is imperative. Thank you for the engagement today, and I very much look forward to the discussion ahead. Again, welcome to the third annual conference and to the beautiful town of Collingwood, although virtually. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor Hull, for um, charting the way forward for this summit and for the Collingwood and as well as the lessons of Collingwood, what it will have for um, other cities and small cities and towns globally as well. Thanks again once more. The meeting, the summit today would not have been possible, but for the singular committed vision of one person amongst us that is Reza Purvasiri, chair of the urban economy forum and co-director of the world urban pavilion region park powered by daniels canada Reza Purvasiri is an architect with over 20 years of experience he has organized conferences initiatives and workshops he has also been an ambassador for UN habitat and he is one of the initiators of world urban pavilion and region park a collaborative initiative between Urban Economy Forum and UN Habitat supported by the Government of Canada and Daniels Corporation. While focusing on urban issues, um, sustainable urban development, 
as well as um, World Urban Pavilion and the need for small city leaders and town leaders to bring together as a network. He is also focusing on the plight of those people who are facing oppression and looking for freedom in many parts of the world. Thank you very much. Here you are, Reza Puru Waziri. Hello, everyone. Dear ladies, gentlemen, and distinguished guests, I appreciate you all for joining us at the third Falling Wood World Summit, Habitat in Towns. As many of you know, we are in urban October, last day. Towns and small cities are important in the conversation about sustainable urban development and achieving the SDGs 17 goals. I'm pleased to address you all today from the World Urban Pavilion in Regent Park, powered by Daniel. Known as the Pavilion, this is a space for you, a space for global knowledge exchange sustainable urban development and best practices. I hope you all leverage the pavilion to share ideas, learn from each other and achieve your sustainable urban development objects. I want to take this opportunity to deeply appreciate Daniel's cooperation to support pavilion. I recently received Unfortunate news that the founder of Daniel Corporation, John H. Daniel, recently passed away. We will for, forever remember his name and his contribution to building something better for all. His name and his legacy is part of the pavilion story. It's a story. The town of Hollywood has been a strong partner of the Urban Economy Forum and is not only leading this dialogue, but also leading through actions. This global summit would not have been successful without Collingwood, and we hope to continue this wonderful and syn synergic collaboration. Step by step, we have worked together to put this global summit about towns and small cities on the map of important urban conferences across the globe. This year, the main theme is on housing and sustainable finance. This is an important conversation as we are now in the decade in action. As many of you know, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation is one of the founder of the Pavilion. Their collaboration is important for the Pavilion and for us here today, because we are looking for those innovation approaches to sustainable urban development that are transformative. We look forward to hearing more from CMHC later today, and we hope to create a pilot project in Collingwood to demonstrate how towns can lead this conversation for realizing SDGs. We hope that throughout the conference, we can identify some key areas to establish pilot projects in towns and small cities around the world. Understand the innovation, the challenges that need to be overcome and how we can implement these programs. We want to take these lessons to the pavilion. I want to encourage you all to share your best practices with us. We have been working with Harvard University to identify, collect, assess, and catalog made in Canada urban innovations. This is part of the Pavilion analytical frameworks to help with Canada's profile for urban SDGs. Sustainable housing is a critical topic in many of our towns and cities today. It's important that we work together to create a new initiative with new approaches to facilitate an urban transformation in our towns and small cities. But we must not forget the urban identity of our towns and create a feeling of closeness and home. 
technology and urban growth and density is changing many things. But how can we blend these emerging challenges to create a solution for habitat and housing? We must consider the contextual needs of our town to maintain the urban fabric while also recognizing the need to identify creative solutions to generate financial resources. The future opportunities and the social and environmental impact through urban and financial sustainability is significant. Central government must acknowledge the importance of investing in our towns and small cities to facilitate sustainable growth. This can also help to leverage the private sector and other financial institutions to invest in our towns. The centralization of our current system inhabits the autonomy and authority of our localities. I hope this will also be discussed during the two days. Towns also were required to absorb new people as they migrated from larger cities to towns. This also presents new opportunity for towns and small cities to generate a new tax basis and new economic opportunities. But towns must recognize this opportunity to encourage and embrace changes in our globe. I wish you all a great two days summit. I know I will gain many insight and knowledge from our excellent and expert speakers from across the globe. As a final note, I want to emphasize the importance to create a network of town leaders and establish a secretariat to lead and advocate the voice of town leaders at the national and international states. We must balance the distribution of opportunities between our metropolitan city and towns. This must even go all the way to the United Nations conversation. We will launch our network of town leaders and we encourage the mayors to join us in this conversation and help to form this mayoral network of towns. We look forward to finalizing this in this coming weeks. Again, I appreciate the town of Collingwood for all your great work, and I hope to see you all in person for the next summit. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reza, for um, your words, setting the tone for the meeting. As you mentioned that um, we have the World Urban Pavilion, which is an open space for exchange of of exchange of experiences, good practices, and a way forward on SDGs, uh, where uh, small cities and towns should actually participate in the Knowledge Exchange Hub. Thank you very much again for your words, and uh, we hope that you'll continue um, providing us with guidance on this subject. And the question of uh, setting up a town leaders network, which I think is quite important, as you have mentioned, this was indeed adopted as a part of the resolution for last year's summit. So we have to see how this town leaders network indeed becomes a reality, like what we have of big cities, a C40 a network. We should be able to form the town leaders network. And one of the outcomes of this summit, hopefully, will be the practical ways of how do we establish the town leaders network. In that context, may I request you to look at the draft resolution that's already on the web, I think, from this um, summit, where your inputs are important the inputs from the discussions in the different groups will actually be distilled into the, um, uh, the resolution and eventually be passed at the end of the day. So in the course of uh, the two next two days, we should also be participating in enriching the existing draft so that the resolution can become action-oriented and forward-looking. So as we said earlier by, um, by um, Ilda, that while the main theme is sustainable housing and finance, we have four sub themes. One is our housing and finance. The focus will sort of gain better understanding of the workforce housing, which is something important that Collingwood has been focusing on. And uh, then we have the uh, theme of town level sustainability, 
the third theme is climate change challenges and opportunities and so the the and then the sustainability and the role of uh, data processing and the question of data collection at the town level so um, may i then sorry thank christian i'm sorry to interrupt but we didn't do did we do mp mpp brian sanderson's video message it'll come it'll come it has not yet come no it'll it's uh, available it's available okay yes so, so in that so we we then we have these four sub teams that i would again request you to kindly look at um, look at the draft resolution uh, before this first session ends with a message from the the um, member of the provincial parliament brian saunderson who was also a mayor of collingwood who was instrumental in um, establishing the you know, collingwood summit uh, number one and two and he has providing advice all the way in how this summit actually should take shape. Maybe have the uh, message from uh, Brian Saunderson, who is the member of the provincial parliament, Simcoe Gray, Ontario, Canada. Thanks. Brian Saunderson, MPP Simcoe Gray. It is a great pleasure to welcome you to the third annual Collingwood World Summit on behalf of Premier Ford and the Government of Ontario. The summit is a collective effort between the Town of Collingwood and the Urban Economy Forum. Announced in the fall of 2019 before the global outbreak of the COVID pandemic and launched in 2020 during the first year. I know from experience that the summit will bring subject matter experts and leaders from around the globe to provide insightful and thought-provoking commentary on each of the four main themes. I also know from experience the planning and work that goes into the organization of the summit and I want to congratulate and thank Mayor Hall, the steering committee and the hard-working staff at the Town of Collingwood and the Urban Economy Forum for their commitment to making this event happen. As you know, the mission of the summit is to promote the UN Sustainable Development Goals and SDG 11 in particular, to build towns that are safe, inclusive, resilient and sustainable. The Ford government is committed to working with municipalities, the federal government and stakeholders to get more housing built, to get the appropriate types of housing built and to make life more affordable for all Ontarians. Approximately 70% of Ontarians get their drinking water from the Great Lakes and this government is committed to protecting the Great Lakes and the rivers and watersheds that feed their waters. The Made in Ontario Environmental Plan is focused on our freshwater resources and protecting them and maintaining their integrity. Our government believes that the economy and the environment are not mutually exclusive and that we can create sustainable green jobs that provide good pay and security and reduce our carbon footprint at the same time. We are making Ontario a world leader in electric car manufacturing, in electric battery production and in greening key industries such as the steel industry by helping to finance the conversion from blast furnaces to electric arc furnaces that will remove the equivalent of one million cars on the roads for an entire year in carbon each year. I want to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. Please enjoy the summit. I know you're in for a very interesting, impactful and productive two days. We will, um, thank you, thank you, um, Brian Sonderson, member of the provincial parliament for your good wishes for this summit. We have a final um, speech by um, Julie Ward, who was a former member. Yeah, hi, Krishna. I'm sorry. Julie Ward's having technical difficulties. Um, you could probably summarize the session and we can move to next. Okay. So, um, yeah. So, I mean, as you know, it's a virtual conference, so we, may, we will have the opportunity for Julie to come to us later. So, as I mentioned earlier, the, 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 the four sub teams are important in uh, bringing back the uh, results of the discussions to the um, uh, to the resolution. So I would then uh, end this session by requesting you to look at the look at the draft resolution and to see how it can be enriched, how it can be made action oriented, uh, coming from the discussions today and tomorrow. Then now we have the keynote session starting actually six minutes in advance, and um, which is which is not a bad thing anyway. If we are already uh, are we then? Ilda? Please move forward. Yes, Krishnan. There's six yeah. speakers in the next session. That's fine. Okay, fine. All right, then. So um, the, the maiden leave the floor to um, 
his worship Keith Hull to chair the session keynote session. Um, that is uh, um, Mayor uh, Mayor Keith Hull. The floor is yours to take the chair. Uh, thank you, and uh, again, welcome to uh, everyone. And uh, I appreciate uh, the time that you have afforded us to uh, uh, present uh, our keynote this morning. We have uh, seven individuals that are joining us. Uh, first, we'll provide remarks, and then we have six individuals that will be providing uh, keynote uh, comments. And uh, the comments, I hope, will provide uh, context and flavor uh, and thought uh, for consideration as we advance through the, uh, the next two days. So uh, over the next 60 minutes, um, you are going to benefit from the expertise of seven keynote speakers with a wide range of ex uh, experience that will inform our work on the themes, uh, proposed outcomes and resolutions as our final act of the two-day summit. Uh, as a matter of uh, housekeeping, uh, I think that we've been uh, good to, so far but I would just uh, kindly remind that all attendees, if you're not speaking or participating, please uh, keep your microphone muted. Um, this particular first session as a keynote uh, will be addressed. There is not a question and answer at the end, but uh, if there is something that is uh, thought provoking or perhaps something that uh, you would like to have further clarification on at a later date, I would certainly encourage you to make note of it. And as a steering committee, I think that we would be more than happy to uh, take your question and uh, follow up best we can uh, after uh, in, in a timely fashion. So what we propose this morning is that uh, each individual, uh, the, the first will have three to five minutes and then the balance, the six will have about five to seven minutes. At uh, the six minute mark for the individuals, I will hold up a uh, a yellow cautionary card that will just indicate that there's a minute left and uh, so that uh, it gives you time or I should say gives you awareness as, as to the time uh, that you're working with. Um, and I do offer apologies in advance uh, to some of our speakers in terms of uh, pronunciation or enunciation of names. And uh, I say that with sincerity as somebody who has a fairly uh, simple surname, Hull, H-U-L-L, -L, and yet has grown up often being referred to as Hall, H-A-L-L, Hill, H-A-L-L, H-I-L-L, et cetera. Uh, so uh, for others, I certainly can appreciate that you have uh, wonderfully uh, unique names that are uh, you know, uh, distinctive to your culture, your community, and uh, if I mis mispronounce, please correct me so that uh, those who are joining us clearly uh, know the proper enunciation of your name. Okay. So uh, with that, um, our first keynote uh, speaker is Kamran Hassani Spilly. He's the Executive Director of Urban Economy Forum Canada. Mr. Kamran is uh, a network system and industrial engineer who has been involved in designing and executing business and development initiatives. He comes with academic knowledge along with comprehensive professional experience in the network database feasibility study, business plan and development projects. He's a professor at CDI College and continues to engage in development projects. It's my pleasure to introduce Mr. Cameron Hassani Smilly to be our first speaker this morning. Good morning, everyone. Urban Economy Forum is pleased to continue working with the Colin Woods fantastic team to establish this amazing global summit. It is great to collaborate directly with towns to have such an essential network to towns leaders. This is crucial to realizing sustainable urban development. All United Nations member States adapt to the Sustainable Development Goals stages in 2015 as a universal call to action to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure that all people enjoying peace and prosperity by 2030. The 17th Goals stages all integrated, that is, they recognize 
the action in one area will affect outcome in others and then social, economic and environmental dimension should be balanced. As you all know, technology has had transformative and disruptive impact on our world. We must correctly understand the opportunities, the challenge that technology can bring. More specifically, we need to measure where town and small cities stand on their respective national goals to achieve the SDGs. We need to analyze how town use innovation ecosystem to operationalize and rethink sustainable development from the ground up and facilitate a dialogue between lower and upper level of the governments. Without assessing these opportunities and the needs of our towns, we can't move forward. Technology can help to monitor our efforts and impact and help identify mm -hmm. focal areas that will have the most significant impact. It is all comes down to data. To measure process toward realizing the stages, we need to undertake appropriate data collection, analysis, and performance to support town-to-town -town learning through the transparency and accountability. Urban data and management of this data can offer extraordinary opportunities. Urban data is complicated with each sector and component interacting with each other dynamically, but the benefits are huge. This is one of the following steps of our works and bringing this to towns and cities. Regional planning is important to town planning. At the same time, towns have direct interaction with regional governments. Regional governments also require access to correct data that can provide better investment opportunities. Each the central government can make better decision between the rural and town connection by assessing better town data. Town data can provide many insights into current challenge, such as the demand and supply of housing and provide solution that can address housing challenge and incorporate social impacts. Because at the end of the day, data can also tell us about the inequalities that our society are facing. This transition is already happening. And to facilitate this effective transition, we need to join global report for town from the global north and south to understand how that can help make the most impactful choice that affect the most people in their daily lives. We will continue to focus on focus on this and share our structure for this program. Towns and small cities can be fortunate to achieving the stages, but they require the capacity to implement sustainable initiatives. We're looking forward to hearing from the keynote speaker. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, those uh, thoughtful uh, opening remarks. It's uh, appreciated. Uh, with that, we will move to our uh, first uh, keynote speaker, and it is uh, uh, Dr. Remy uh, Chi Peng. And I do apologize if I've uh, mispronounced uh, your last name. Um, he's the Chief of Policy of Legislation and Governance Section, Urban Practices Branch for UN Habitat. He's the Chief Policy Legislation and Governance Section within the Urban Practices Branch of the UN Habitat. He is currently overseeing the development of strategic programs of UN Habitat, including urban policy, legislation, governance, and urban rural linkages, smart cities, and metropolitan management. And with that, I will uh, turn the floor uh, over to uh, Dr. Remy Shidapeng. Mayor Keith Hall, I don't do uh, Remy's not in yet. He has been okay. sent to. to Okay. Uh, so with that, then I do have uh, 
Mr. Mason here on my screen, so I'm going to move uh, to our next speaker, and uh, that is uh, Mr. Paul Mason. And uh, Mr. Mason is the Senior Vice President, Client Solutions, Canada Mortgage and Housing Corporation. As Senior Vice President of Client Solutions, Paul Mason leads a team that brings together the expertise of CMHC's commercial and assisted housing businesses to develop solutions that better meet Canadians' housing needs. Paul joined CMHC in 2016 as Chief Information Officer leading a sweeping technology and business transformation aimed at giving employees the tools and physical environment to, to deliver their best on behalf of Canadians. In 2019, he was appointed Senior Vice President, Client Operations. It's my pleasure this morning to welcome Mr. Paul Mason. Uh, thank welcome. you so much. Thank you so much, Keith, for the introduction. And uh, as someone who has worked in technology, I appreciate the challenges and empathize with a virtual uh, meeting of this sort. So uh, thanks for all of you for taking part in today's event. Um, I'm pleased to be joining you from my home here in Ottawa, which is the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Um, as someone whose work is intrinsically bound up with land, I think it's particularly important to think about the history of the land we are on, its caretakers, and the benefits it has brought to all of us, and to be grateful for that. Just as I'm grateful to you for having me here today, it's a great event with a theme that we at CMHC are deeply invested in. Everything we do is built on a similar idea. Ensuring people have a home they can afford that meets their needs is the starting point that allows them to participate more broadly in society. A suitable home is the starting point for sustainable development, health and well-being, education, decent work. None of this is possible without shelter. As Matthew Desmond so eloquently put it, the home is the wellspring of personhood. And of course, in keeping with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal 11, we know that housing plays a vital role uh, in creating communities that are inclusive, safe, resilient, and sustainable. But in Canada, like many countries, our housing affordability crisis threatens our ability to achieve this goal. And whereas housing affordability used to be just a big city problem, we're now seeing it in small cities and towns as well, even though some of the challenges differ. For example, construction and labor costs for housing are often higher in less densely populated areas. Rental options, including affordable rental, may be limited or unavailable, and housing options and supportive services for certain vulnerable populations, like growing senior populations, for example, may not be as easily accessible as in urban communities. Recently, especially in the context of the pandemic, small cities and towns are seeing unprecedented population growth. For example, Collingwood and nearby Blue Mountain have experienced double digit growth over the last decade and continue to grow. Growth is good for the economy and jobs, but it can be detrimental to the environment if not managed appropriately. That's one reason why CMHC is committed to making climate change part of everything that we do. We aim to take leadership role in steering Canada towards a less carbon intensive housing system, while also helping our country prepare for the inevitable changes that are already in motion. We are doing this through programs like under our national housing strategy. One example is our support for research to modular construction and other housing innovation sector innovations. Another is the National Housing Co-Investment Fund, our flagship affordable housing program, which focuses on developing energy efficient, accessible and socially inclusive housing. In fact, all of our supply programs under the National Housing Strategy have minimum energy efficiency requirements. We are also using some of our commercial products to achieve a more sustainable housing system. For example, we recently rolled out a new product in our multi-unit mortgage loan insurance called MLI Select, which supports multiple social outcomes, including energy efficiency, but also accessibility and affordability. CMHC is also supporting other federal partners to develop a national adaptation strategy, which will be released at the end of 2022. The strategy will outline how the Canadian economy and society can be more resilient and prepared for the impacts of climate change, such as flooding, heat waves, and fires. We've actually come to understand that we can't truly separate climate compatibility from our other housing, afford our other housing goals, such as affordability. In fact, it is becoming increasingly clear that affordability and climate compatibility are not actually in conflict, but two sides of the same coin. For example, living in an energy efficient home will only become more expensive, inefficient home, pardon me, will only become more expensive as the car cost of carbon inevitably rises. And climate related severe weather events will increase operating and maintenance risks and costs. The cost of repairs following a flood, for example, can be devastating. 
Restructuring the housing finance system to incentivize and support both climate change mitigation and adaptation now will make the transition smoother and ultimately more affordable. The only sustainable system is one that leaves no one behind. But no single organization can achieve this alone. Our housing system is complex and faces many challenges in affordability. What's more, how we achieve this differs somewhat for smaller communities compared to large urban centers. That is why we're putting a strong emphasis on partnerships with the private and nonprofit sectors and other orders of government as well. Municipalities know their needs best, and so we design many of our programs in a way that helps us put that knowledge to the best use. Which brings me to a new program in development that we're very excited about called the uh, Housing Accelerator Fund. The Canadian federal budget in the spring provided $4 billion over five years to launch this fund. It will seek to incent reforms to municipal planning and reduce systemic barriers that slow or prevent new housing supply. It's first and foremost a, su a supply initiative and will target communities facing the strongest growth pressures. After being proposed this year, the Housing Accelerator Fund received support from across the system, including the Federation of Canadian Municipalities, the Canadian Home Builders Association, and the Canadian Housing and Rural Association. It just won't work if without this sort of buy-in throughout the sector. All of our housing activities are built on the idea of collaboration. We have an ambitious goal for ourselves, a safe and affordable place to call home for everyone in Canada, but we won't attain it unless we can bring all orders of government together with the private and not-for-profit sectors. This of course ties directly to SDG 11. Relating our work back to the Sustainable Development Goals is a clear and crucial reminder of who our real stakeholders are, the people who will live in the homes we're trying to provide. It also reminds us not to get complacent. The Housing Accelerator Fund and other new programs being put in place in Canada will produce results, but as things stand, it just won't be enough. The demand for housing continues to outpace supply in many countries, including Canada. High inflation and increased interest rates around the world are also putting housing more out of reach for many. And these phenomena are increasing global inequality. So governments alone can't overcome the barriers. It's why events like this one are crucial, because this event too is a reminder. It's a reminder that we aren't working alone and that we're working together. And we're working towards a housing system that includes everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Thank you, uh, Mr. Mason, for your uh, comments. And uh, certainly a key takeaway is that uh, when we are looking at um, affordability and sustainability, uh, certainly it's not unique to Collingwood, it, uh, it is uh, happening elsewhere. And that is that we really have to take a look at um, housing and inventory that has been built over an extended period of time that is maybe exceeded its life capacity, uh, is not efficient, and therefore is compounding the issue of affordability for many within our community who are paying perhaps excessively high rents uh, based on market demand. Uh, but in addition to that, um, having to pay for uh, an increase in utilities related to um, the price of carbon, et cetera. So uh, those are you know, really high level things that we need to be thinking about as we continue to move forward uh, to be able to uh, tackle affordability and sustainability at the same time. So thank you. And for those who are not familiar with uh, perhaps some of the programs that uh, both CMHC as well as other federal agencies offer, I certainly encourage you to take a look at the Government of Canada website. There are hidden programs that uh, are accessible uh, to Canadians to be able to take advantage of uh, funding options, grants, et cetera, for retrofitting to make homes uh, more uh, um, uh, energy efficient, et cetera, and therefore affordable. So again, thank you, Mr. Mason. With that, it uh, is my pleasure then to um, introduce our next uh, speaker. And uh, our speaker is uh, um, Sherlata uh, Sumal. And um, I just want to confirm, uh, Ilda, that uh, Sherlata is with us this morning. There she is. Great. Yes, she is. Fantastic. And uh, Chaletta is the uh, IA, IAS uh, Deputy Commissioner of Kodaga District. Uh, Chaletta Samal is an ISA, IAS Deputy Commissioner of Kodaga District in India. She has an economic honors degree from St. Stephen's College of Delhi University uh, and has uh, previously held uh, several posts, including 
as commissioner for Shimoka City Corporation and attached to the Chief's Minister's office. A committed environmentalist, Shaletta is the first IAS officer to have gone on an expedition to Antarctica in March of 2016. It's my pleasure to introduce Shaletta Samal. Welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you for uh, having me as uh, part of this uh, conference. And uh, I would like to uh, share uh, my experience as an urban manager and um, my, 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 uh, my thoughts may not be limited only to the sector of housing. I would like to give a brief overview of urban governance um, in the context uh, of India. And uh, um, in, in India, as per the constitution of India, we have the third tier of government. So we have the center, we have the state, and the third tier is the local bodies, which could be rural local bodies and urban local bodies. Uh, since this is um, a conference related to towns and cities, I will focus on the challenges um, and thoughts on urban governance. Um, in the Indian context, uh, urban governance primarily um, constitutes three critical Fs. The first is functions, the second is finances, and the third is functionaries. For the successful working of any urban local body, we need a delegation of roles and responsibilities um, to the urban local bodies. We need adequate finances and finances not only for building infrastructure, but also finances for maintaining infrastructure. And the third is functionaries. So functionaries include the political functionaries where they are elected members in the urban governance context. And functionaries also includes officials who will be appointed by the government and they are part of the uh, uh, the day-to-day the -day, uh, maintenance of urban local body assets and providing all of the various services. Uh, coming to functions first, in the context of key roles and responsibilities, there are a few mandatory functions for urban local bodies from the smallest towns in the country to the largest uh, cities. And uh, the functions are construction of roads and bridges, water supply, sewerage and drainage, public health, sanitation and solid waste management, lighting, public streets, places and buildings, slum improvement, upgradation, and last but not the least, urban poverty alleviation programs. So when we look at the mandatory functions of uh, uh, urban local bodies in the context of India, we do realize that we have a huge task set out for us because uh, there are a lot of gaps in infrastructure, which is the physical infrastructure, the built infrastructure, and also the infrastructure in terms of uh, manpower and availability of uh, uh, finances. Uh, coming to the next point of uh, finances uh, uh, within the uh, uh, urban local body. So when we are looking at the key functions that a city, the city administration, um, the municipality or the manager is uh, supposed to um, take care of. We also do then require the backup of adequate and sufficient funds to ensure that we are able to uh, move our cities in the right direction towards uh, better quality of living and uh, better socioeconomic uh, development. I'm not doing the one-to-one -one exercise of mapping these roles to the SDGs. Um, that would be a more time uh, consuming process. I'm just going through uh, uh, the broad thought and understanding. So in the context of finances for the towns and cities in the country, uh, we have grants that come through the central government. We have grants that come through the state government. And third, we have funds and resources which are generated through the municipalities uh, of their own accord. And the third aspect becomes the most critical because uh, when we are looking at any city developing, it requires huge amounts of investment. And especially in the context of India, no city is uh, uh, sufficiently funded through its own sources to be able to take care of um, its own 
roles and responsibilities and to be able to take care of its own mandatory functions uh, that it has to meet out uh, for the needs of the citizens of any city. Um, so when we speak about uh, the own funds, there are various sources we have property taxes, we have uh, waste management cess, uh, we have various development fees and um, uh, you know such and such uh, various funds and uh, two aspects that become very important uh, in the context of urban local bodies and it's the Indian experience is that A, when we speak about own resources of any city, there has to be a coincidence of the willingness of the citizen to pay and the ability of uh, the citizen to pay. Secondly, uh, when we speak about own resources, apart from the coincidence of the willingness and the ability of the citizen to pay, it is also equally important to have the willingness and the ability of the urban local body to collect any funds um, any taxes and um, cess and other fees that are due and it is in this context of um, enforcement between the citizens and the uh, urban administration that we face a huge challenge and we realize that many of the Indian cities are ill-equipped um, to not only build and invest in their own infrastructure but uh, they are also not necessarily sufficiently equipped with respect to the uh, maintenance of uh, um, the water supply, maintenance of roads, maintenance of street lights, uh, solid waste management, um, and such and such. And uh, in this context, over the years, uh, there has uh, uh, the government of India through various uh, schemes and uh, through various programs and uh, policies has uh, invested a lot in um, improving um, uh, uh, the development uh, uh, landscape in the cities and through the government of India, we have projects such as the Smart City Mission, uh, which uh, has uh, identified uh, about 100 uh, smart cities across the country, uh, which will be islands of excellence uh, for projects and, uh, uh, you know, they will be the lighthouse projects which other cities can take inspiration uh, from and move towards development and it also gives a lot of scope for um, innovation which can then be replicated in the other cities. The Swaj Bharat mission, uh, which focuses on uh, cleanliness uh, based management um, and a lot of progress in the last five years has been made in the um, sector of waste management. Um, uh, within the city, starting from sorting segregation uh, to um, ultimately processing um, any of the waste. Then we also have the Atal Mission for Rejuvenation and Urban Transformation, Heritage City Development. Uh, so the government of India and the various state governments have been committed to uh, improve uh, the built infrastructure um, in uh, the towns and uh, cities uh, of the country of India. However, uh, we have a lot of uh, we face we face a lot of uh, um, challenges and uh, uh, of course finances uh, uh, there's only uh, so much money that is there in the system and uh, the gaps are very large so finances and the need for innovative financial tools to finance development of cities becomes uh, very critical uh, trained. Uh, functionaries, which would include the political functionaries and the official machinery that works in the context of urban local bodies. And most importantly is that no city works in isolation. And in every city, uh, there is a requirement for interagency coordination because not only do we have gas, electricity, water supply, sewerage, drainage, and such and such, all of these utilities are managed by different agencies. and. Uh, there are challenges of um, interagency uh, coordination and uh, um, uh, damage to infrastructure because the projects are taken up uh, practically speaking at different points in time and uh, uh, that leads to a lot of uh, cost um, and uh, time overruns um, however the challenges also that um, i have spoken of right now are also being identified uh, by the state governments, by the central governments, and a lot of effort is being made uh, in the right direction. 
to overcome these challenges and to ensure that we are able to provide the basic uh, minimum facilities and we are able to provide the basic standards of uh, living and uh, livability from the smallest uh, um, towns to the largest cities um, in the country. Thank you for your um, your uh, remarks this morning. It uh, is truly appreciated to have a global perspective and to be able to uh, you know connect uh, from a global perspective uh, the challenges that um, uh, are faced by smaller municipalities globally. Um, it is uh, through your comments. Uh, you know, it, it's not. Uh, unique to, to one place or one region or one area of the, uh, the globe uh, to hear that uh, lower municipalities are facing challenges as it relates to delivering services, uh, you know, basic infrastructure, et cetera, uh, and the costs that are borne and uh, the ever increasing uh, cost to be able to deliver those uh, services to our uh, constituents. And uh, I greatly appreciate uh, you joining us this morning uh, here in Collingwood. And uh, perhaps we will have an opportunity because I think that probably uh, many people who are here uh, this morning would love someday to be able to hear about your experiences in Antarctica. I'm sure that they were uh, fascinating. And I would uh, love to connect. I would love to connect uh, with anybody who would like to hear of my experiences. Thank you well, so there, much. There's the open invitation. So thank you for being with us. It's very appreciated. Our, um, Next speaker is uh, Mr. Uh, David uh, Aubrey, and uh, he is the Interregional Advisor for UN Habitat. In his role as Interregional Advisor with UN Habitat, David Aubrey provides technical and policy advice to national and local governments on a broad range of urban issues, including forced and crisis response. He also coordinates UN Habitat subprogram, Enhanced Shared Prosperity of Cities and Regions, and the global flagship initiative, SDG Cities. It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome Mr. David Aubrey. Thank you very much, Keith, and thank you to uh, the City of Collingwood and also um, the Urban Economy Forum for this, uh, this event. Uh, I always find these events extremely fascinating and extremely global and bringing the Canada focus uh, within as a sort of Canada being part of the world at large and bringing in the, those national and uh, international experiences together. And, uh, um, so thank you very much for inviting me. So I've been asked to talk about the um, SDG Cities uh, Global Flagship Initiative. And um, before I do, uh, since uh, CMHC was here earlier, hopefully still are, uh, we just want to acknowledge uh, the support that we've had from uh, CMHC to get this uh, flagship initiative off the ground. Uh, we've been working at the global level and it will be our priority then to bring the initiative very strongly uh, through the World Urban Pavilion uh, into Canada uh, as our sort of next priority in moving forward. So let me just describe this uh, initiative briefly. Um, I'll just try and share my slides if I, if I can. Um, uh, yes. Okay, I think we're up. Um, so, so basically, SDG Cities responds to the the need to to accelerate the SDGs. I mean, we've had them since 2015. Uh, it's a fantastic global agenda, and uh, but we also see that there's a need to really accelerate these, and we see the opportunity of cities to be a driving force for the global achievement of sustainable development and through the, uh, and of these goals. And what I love about the goals is that um, they uh, provide the opportunity for um, um, they, 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 they just resonate with us. You know, the, these are the things that uh, we all care about. We all care about uh, being able to educate our children to be living in healthy environments, to have access to, to basic services, to reduce inequality. Um, a lot of us have just experienced very hot summers, surprisingly hot in some places, and we're recognizing that climate change is really an issue that needs to be addressed. Um, we 
we, we long for a world that's more equal, where women and men and all genders are treated with dignity. And so these SDGs are just uh, fantastic uh, aspirations, but very important targets and very important goals for us um, uh, worldwide. And uh, what we recognize is that the battle for sustainable development uh, will be won or lost in cities. Basically, uh, as we mentioned, even from Collingwood, that the, the city is growing and cities across the world are growing very, very quickly. And as the world continues to urbanize very rapidly, we have to kind of catch the moment to make sure that urbanization is a driving force for sustainable development. And that is hanging in the balance in a way, because on one hand, while cities are generating a lot of economy just by bringing together uh, the factors of production into close proximity, and also by bringing together a diversity of people and their ideas and their backgrounds is driving innovation as well as prosperity. We're also seeing that the world, that, the, that cities are generating um, a disproportionate amount of, of the world's greenhouse gases and the, and the world's waste. And we're also seeing in, in inequality increasing in cities, higher, higher sort of, um, rates of inequality in, in cities. And that often uh, drives uh, social unrest as well, which we've seen uh, being a challenge in the, in the last couple of decades. And we're also just, uh, you know, more recently with, with COVID, we also identified the fact that underserved neighborhoods and these sort of little pockets of deprivation that exist across cities worldwide, they've also become real sort of hotspots for health risks. Uh, but we also recognize as per the new urban agenda, uh, which came out of the sort of uh, city summit in 2016, uh, that when cities are well planned and well governed and well managed, they can be truly driving forces for a sustainable future. Well-planned cities can reduce climate impacts. Uh, Well-planned cities can reduce poverty and can reduce inequality and can drive prosperity. So the, the way that we deal with cities is so important to driving sustainable development. So I made reference just now to, to the new urban agenda. And that kind of provides a kind of a blueprint of how do cities drive sustainable development. And they're sort of five main sort of um, pillars really. One is policies and I think national development policies need to be then reflected in urban policies and we have to see how do cities and human settlements and territorial uh, planning, how does that contribute to achieving uh, the, the development objectives of the country. So this, cities shouldn't happen by accident, they need to be uh, driven by policy. And um, at the local level and also national level and in between, there's the governance. We need to make sure that the governance is inclusive and accountable and leaves no one behind. And that there's trust between people and local and regional governments as well as national government. And then there's, there's a need for planning. So a, a good plan will, will generate economic, social and environmental uh, impacts. So uh, a good compact city with good mixed mixes of use um, uh, good density, high allocation of public spaces and good, co good connectivity uh, means that you can move around the city very easily. You don't have to spend ages in a, in a jam um, and the productivity of the city can increase and with good access to public space, you're creating that sort of sp social uh, space for communities to engage. And so good planning will drive simultaneously uh, economic, social and environmental dimensions. And of course, good plans will sit, sit on the shelf unless there's money to implement them. So they have to be implemented through infrastructure. And it's important that infrastructure is distributed in an equitable way that leaves no communities behind, but also contributes to economic development and is, is invested in a way that's environmentally sustainable. And then you want to be able to invest in infrastructure without revenue. So then there needs to be effective revenue systems. And then you start to see this kind of virtuous cycle that uh, cities uh, through good planning and good governance are generate and good infrastructure generating good local economies and as the economy continues to improve the revenue system should improve which means that the the services of the city continue to to improve so there is a way to get cities right and uh, there, there's some good guidance in the new urban agenda we've recently published the um, the new urban agenda illustrated handbook because the agenda itself uh, generated through consensus of 193 member states can be a bit of a dry document so we've sort of brought it to life with this illustrated version which you can see on our website 
Well, SDG Cities then tries to support cities on this kind of journey of sustainability. And it tries to connect. Morning is uh, Dr. Alias Bin Ramali. And um, <clears throat> he's the uh, Director General of Town and Country Planning. Uh, Dr. Bin Ram Ramali is uh, working as Director General, Federal Department of Town and Country Planning, Plan <coughs> Malaysia, Ministry of Housing and Local Government. He's graduated from University of Technology, Malaysia, UTM, with a bachelor's degree uh, in town and regional planning, Master of Science in Land Administration and Management, and Doctor of Philosophy in Urban and Regional Planning and Housing. It's my pleasure to introduce and welcome Dr. Elias Bin Ramali. Welcome, sir. Okay, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, good evening from Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. And today I will speak on the topic um, on uh, housing the nation. And I will share some initiative from Malaysia in making housing affordable. And uh, still waiting for the slide. Someone, um, my click, um, try to um, share the slides. You can you share the access. slides, you have access. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, next slide. Okay, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, the Malaysian government is is committed to um, in ensuring the provision of adequate, affordable, quality, and livable housing to meet the needs of growing populations. And thus, the government has set the aspirations of one family, one house goal. And this strategy is very important to ensure low and medium income groups, including youth generation, have an access to affordable housing. We learn from previous loophole and weakness of housing strategy. We do not want to develop an affordable, affordable housing. Next slide. We believe government intervention in terms of policy and plan is necessary in housing the nation. We cannot leave it to the market-led development, to the leisure fair economy, to handle housing needs for Malaysian populations. So from the socioeconomic um, policy and plan for a five years Malaysia plan, we also have the national housing policy. We also specific national affordable housing policy. At the same time, we also have a national council for affordable housing chaired by the prime minister. And to translate the socioeconomic policy on housing, we have a special uh, urban planning plan starting from the uh, national level call at the national physical plan and convert it to the state structure plan and the end and with the local plan or special area plans so briefly on the um, demography and housing profile for malaysia so our population was uh, forecasted 32.7 million in 2021 so the latest data shows that uh, the rate of home ownership in Malaysia is steadily increased from um, year to year in 2020, so generally 76% own the housing and the rest is under the rented uh, status. So to show the, gov the government commitment for affordable housing, the Malaysia government is committed to build an affordable homes with a target of 500,000 units for, for five years nationwide throughout the implementation of a 12 Malaysia plan involving the federal government, state government, and private housing developers. So in, 2000, in two years, 2021 and 22, we have successfully developed up to 77.2% of affordable housing. To meet this target, the federal government provides subsidies, while uh, the state government will provide land and the banks will facilitate in terms of the financing. So this mechanism is to make sure that affordable housing developed by the um, uh, developers of government are available and can be sold at affordable price. So um, next slide. Okay, uh, in terms of the affordable housing program, we have several um, affordable housing to meet the uh, requirement by B40, bottom 40, with certain um, income groups and followed by the M medium um, 40 and the rest is the T20. So um, we have many programs. Next slide, please. Next slide. 
And uh, it means that affordable housing try to cater um, the housing needs for um, medium medium uh, groups and also the affordable early, um, uh, low, low income groups. So in terms of the um, home ownership, we organize home ownership program they call as hope. Before this, the people has to go to the government office. Now we change. Now we change to the government outreach to meet with the people, to meet the low income and medium income groups. That's our that's our work. And we try to match between the housing providers within the uh, and financial schemes and also the we have several program and uh, promotion, including we have a special dashboard for housing price index. Next slide. So number one. So um, in terms of the financing scheme, we have a housing uh, credit guarantee scheme, okay, to assist first time ho uh, home buyers with no fixed income. Next. We also have the uh, My First Home scheme. Call Sorry, I, I, my apologies. Can we please take Okay, no problem, Thank no you. problem, Mr. Ho. No problem. Yes. We also, Sir. Okay, we, okay, can I proceed? Okay. Um, Absolutely. We also have the uh, My First Home Scheme to assist first time housing buyers. And um, and the third one, you also rent to own scheme. Rent to own scheme aim to ensure that the people who uh, the, the loans rejected, so they can rent in five years or in 10 years and the government will offer uh based on the predetermining price not based on the current price that specialty about malaysia so if the price is uh, let's say um ten thousand us dollar last five years the same price offered by the government uh though we sell to them in let's say in 2022 or in 2021 so and the rule of local planning authority is very important. Number one, to facilitate the housing development application. So we have a special call as a one-stop center, OSC, at every local authority in Malaysia. And uh, this rule, their rule is to coordinate, ex expedite the approval process for land development application in land office, and also uh, rule of local planning authority or local authority to um, consider the planning permission, building plans, landscape plan, and other plans. So our role is to coordinate, the, the OC will coordinate, to meet with technical agencies. Normally it's 14 agencies. So we will take one to two months to ensure that all application, in, starting from the planning permission up to the building plan uh, can be reached in one or two months. And also, it's a, also a rule of local planning authority to make sure that the affordable housing develop in um, sustainable and must be equipped with the provision of community facilities. Um, and we have to follow the standards and quality set quite similar with the medium and high cost housing. And uh, for instance, um, public facilities will cover the, um, the um, uh, facilities like the public hall, kindergarten, prayer room, parks and open space, schools, and etc. And sometimes the rule of local authority so to uh, manage about the maintenance fees. So I, I give you an example. One of the PPR scheme, low medium income uh, group scheme, 124 ringgit. I think uh, equivalent to around uh, 30 uh, US dollar. Rental per month, including the maintenance fees. You find uh, in the rest of the world that the uh, we um, try to manage our um, low income group in terms of the housing. So some takeaways from um, Malaysia Initiative on the housing donation, number one. Housing uh, for us is one of the most important components of people's lives particularly in urban setting, because housing represents 70 to 80 percent of land use in the city. It should be seen as a place to live, learn, work, play, and pray, including for development of affordable housing. Number two, housing the nation is very important agenda and a national priority in ensuring people have access to comfortable, quality, and affordable housing. Third one, housing supply and finance are interdependent in providing housing for the delivery of the housing, uh, the nation agenda. And number four, housing requires the rule and action of all parties, federal, state, including the private developers, and some success factors in terms of development of affordable housing in Malaysia. Number one, successful home ownership pro program. 
comprehensive new town planning, integrated uh, new township, the quality housing and quality living and good estate. And uh, as a conclusion, the agenda of housing nation, our ultimate aim, is not only talk about the aspiration of one family, one house. It's not talk about housing per se, but it's talk about the community development. So this is in line with the, the agenda of Malaysia to reach the uh, livable Malaysia agenda and in line with the international goal of the SDG, in, uh, especially SDG number 11 on sustainable cities and communities. That's all uh, for this uh, morning. Thank you very much. That's, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ramali. And um, again, uh, my apologies as your uh, presentation was moving forward. We were interrupted by an outside agency that uh, chose to cause harm as opposed to a proactive message. Uh, your slide deck and perhaps slide decks previous will make uh, public so that those that would uh, like an opportunity to uh, see it in, in its entirety uh, can, can do so. So again, thank you for bringing your uh, comments, your remarks and uh, the experience to date um, in uh, your region of the world. It, uh, it's appreciated. Thank you. Uh, it brings us to our uh, last uh, speaker this morning. Uh, for the first uh, keynote session, and um, that is uh, Dr. Eduardo Lopez Marino. Uh, he's the former director at Habitat Office Mexico and Cuba, and head of knowledge and innovation at UN Habitat. Uh, Dr. Um, Eduardo Lopez Marino is an architect from the University of Guadalajara with more than 25 years of academic and professional experience in the areas of urban development and housing policy, poverty reduction, governance, and institutional analysis. His studies include a doctorate in urban geography at the Sorbonne uh, University in Paris, France, and a master's degree in urban so sociology um, from the University of Paris, Saint Denis, France. Uh, Eduardo Lopez Marino has five books on issues related to social housing, land policies, urban development, and urban history. And with that, uh, I welcome you. And the floor is yours, sir. Thank you. Good morning from Mexico. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I would like to, to devote this time to speak about two issues related to towns. The first, the first one is uh, the notion of classification or reclassification of towns and the related policies. And the second one, I would like to put the accent on the territorial planning dynamics of the role of towns after COVID. But the first one, uh, just to remain, uh, remind everyone, towns uh, are considered in the UN at least 5,000 inhabitants in contiguous moderate density grids, which have also on average 300 inhabitants per square kilometer. And this is, uh, Mr. Chair, interesting. In countries like Brazil, France, Mexico, United States, and Canada, these towns are considered urban. However, with the same population grid, the same population density in countries like Egypt, Vietnam, Kenya, Uganda, and many other Asian and Africans, and I think also India, as the speaker uh, was presenting, are considered uh, rural. And this is not a matter of classification. It has to do with categories and related policies. When they are rural, Rural policies often are ruled by in these areas, but when they are urban, other kind of policies are implemented. And my point is that uh, in the future, we need to look at something different that we call, we used to call in UN Habitat when I was there, the degree of urbanization in order to look more, not to the dichotomy rural urban, but to the continuum rural urban and the research, the policies associated to this in a way that we can understand that our interventions are more for the integration of territories and not the separation of territories based on this rural urban classification that rules today in many parts. This is important for several reasons. One is that uh, if we look in the last 20 years, the population in towns was growing from 1950 to 2020, more than 20 years, sorry, uh, for over 30% uh, of the total of the total population living in, in human settlements. 30% were living in towns. 
And this has not changed. This chair has not changed. But what is important is that we look at absolute numbers. The people living in towns has tripled from 750 million people to 2.2 billion. And this, this is important because it means that today we have at least three times more people living in towns than uh, 30, 40 years ago. Not only that, the share of land occupied by towns has increased also double than the rest of the population. I would like to conclude this first point saying that when we analyze cities and towns, we saw that inequalities tend to be higher in cities, but not always. In other words, some towns can, can be born unequal, but in general terms, as they grow and develop, they become more unequal. And, and this is important again, because it means that uh, policies related to towns should consider financial mechanisms to fight inequality and to fight poverty, and of course, to, to propel growth and development with associated policies. The conclusion of this first point, Mr. Chair, is that uh, uh, towns are needed to rethink the system of cities in countries, something that uh, in more than half of countries in the world has not changed in the last 20 years. There is a need of a new human settlement reclassification in which we need to look at policies at connectivity agglomeration factors. Second point, and I, I will try to keep my time. I would like to make a connection between towns and territorial planning. The growth of population in cities and towns has always led to spatial expansion. In our studies, we have shown that uh, population, as population grew in towns, the urban expansion was at least three times faster and generated a lot of urban sprawl. Uh, concomitant to this problem was the reduction of densities in towns, 30 to 40 percent at the world level. Urban sprawl is also affecting towns, small towns often. And this has to do with energy, with inequality, as I said, with infrastructure, with the economies of agglomeration. We call, and when my, my last meetings in UN Habitat, uh, the, the, what was called the Quito Plus Five conference in New York called for sustainable futures in which we need to slow down and stop urban sprawl. But this is the role that small towns and, and cities can play in the notion of compactness and in the notion of uh, fostering equitable regional development across all city sizes in order to make sure that positive economic, social and environmental interlinkages are connected. My point, uh, Mr. Chair, is that uh, we need to rethink today the role of towns apart, as part of a constellation of larger urban agglomeration. Today, something like 20, 25% of the world population live in urban corridors and mega regions. And this is an important connectivity factor there. This 20% of population living there represents something like 44% of the economic global output. And towns are part of this agenda, should be part of this agenda. This is particularly important with COVID. The second and the third wave of COVID shown that when COVID moved to towns, there was not capacity in the urban rural continuum and much more in the dichotomy rural urban to respond with the territorial responses to the threats associated to health. In conclusion, Mr. Chair, I advocate for a new notion of territorial planning in which connectivity and resilient regions will integrate towns in, an, in a very important manner. In other words, a policy that looks at the regional perspective, but also another one that makes of towns and, and small cities, the need to project ecological and sustainable neighborhoods, uh, resilient communities, in order to make sure that towns can respond to the local community partnerships. When we talk about health, and that's my last point, Mr. Chair, is that uh, in order to modify the urban fabric of cities and towns, there is essential to reconsider the notion of reclassification at territorial urban planning. In that way, we can respond to the most important threats of today as the UN classified them. Inequalities, 
climate action, and the notion of health in cities. In this way, towns will be able to respond better to the future of cities and to the sustainability of the world. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Oh, um, <clears throat> it is I that uh, uh, thank you. And uh, it is greatly appreciated that uh, you've joined us early this morning uh, from the uh, beautiful country of Mexico. So thank you. Um, Again, I would like to just convey to all of uh, our uh, keynote spe speakers within the first session uh, our thank you for bringing uh, a global perspective um, and to be able to provide some, some comments and some takeaways and threads that uh, bring us closer together uh, in the context that we have uh, shared themes, we have shared challenges, we have shared opportunities as it relates to um, both housing finance uh, as well as sustainability uh, as we collectively move forward. And I hope that uh, for those uh, attending this morning and having an opportunity to listen, that there were key takeaways that you will be able to adopt and maybe incorporate in the sessions that will be provided over the next two days as we move forward to uh, the draft resolution and outcome from, uh, from this particular uh, third summit. Um, once again, to our uh, distinguished guests, uh, to everyone uh, this morning, I do apologize for the um, uh, technical interference, uh, and uh, I certainly hope that uh, we will not see that happen once again. Um, it, uh, anyway, it's without further comment, but I do offer that apology. Uh, so with that, I would 